Today we're going to be talking about error handling, some of the different approaches I've seen over the years and the pros and cons to each one. I'm working on a very simple application just to help me keep track of NPM dependencies and I think this makes for a great example of some of the different ways to handle errors. Just to give you an idea of what you're looking at, I have a dashboard of a bunch of different NPM dependencies that I am interested in. I might also be interested in Svelte, so I'm going to go ahead and register that one as well. And every time a new version comes out, I'm going to get a notification. What I'm interested in is how we're going to handle errors here. So for example, let's try. Let's say I try to add a dependency I've already registered, such as Vite. I'm going to get an error telling me it's already been registered. And how we handle this, both from a user experience point of view and from a code point of view, is the topic of today's video. There's a few different ways we could handle this. I'm going to show you the different patterns. Then we're going to walk through the one that I like the best, at least for this application, and why I think it's better. So the first one would be check before submission. The way this would basically work is as follows. I would go ahead and type in here, and we would make an API request checking if this one exists. If it does, we would display an error message and not even allow the user to submit the form. There are some benefits to this approach. The obvious benefit is this very fast feedback. We tell the user there's an error before they even get to submit the form. This is great from a user experience point of view, but there are some downsides as well. In this case, we would need two endpoints. The first would be something like is dependency registered, which would return a response telling us whether it exists or not. We would then need another endpoint to insert the dependency into the database. This means we don't just have two endpoints, it also means we have two database requests. The first one doing the check and the second one doing the insertion. In my experience, databases can be your, uh, one of the biggest bottlenecks in any application, especially as they get more large and more complex. So I'm deciding not to go with this approach, at least for this application. The second option would be to do the submission after we, or the check after we submit the form. In this case, you would submit the form without any feedback and do the check in the back end. We would launch a SQL query to see if a dependency exists belonging to the current user with the same name. If it is a duplicate, we'd go ahead and just throw an error, maybe a 400 or even a 200 with an error property, which is what GraphQL tends to do. Alternatively, we just insert the record, making another SQL request, and then we respond with a 200. We have slightly improved the uh, code point of view uh, with this approach. We only have one API endpoint, which is going to be add dependency. We still have two database requests though, which is something I'm trying to minimize in this application. So let's go ahead and talk about the third approach, which is the one I'm going to show you for this application. And that's going to be don't do any checks and instead rely on the native database constraints, which is a tool we're already using anyway, so we may as well take advantage of it. In this case, the user submits the form and we just try to insert the, rec insert the record no matter what. If everything is okay, uh, we're just going to respond with a 200. If it's not, we're going to get an error. And this is an error going to come from our database library. Uh, it's going to be based on the native constraints and we're going to handle that accordingly. There's definitely some good things about this approach. We have a single API endpoint and we have a single database request. So we're minimizing our latency. We're also writing a lot less code since we're relying on our tooling, uh, primarily our database constraints. There are some downsides to this approach, which is we need to think very carefully about where the error handling occurs we're also potentially coupling ourselves to our database errors. If we change database, those errors may change as well. In my experience, changing databases is very rare, so this is not something I'm too concerned about. Now that we've seen the different approaches, let's go ahead and take a look at the code. We're going to start here from the front end using this handle submit function. We do a bunch of irrelevant checks, and then we get into the bulk of our logic down here. We have try, catch, and finally. I'll talk about those in a moment. What I'd like to focus on firstly is this line here. We're using tRPC, a type safe uh, layer, which is similar to GraphQL in some senses. Uh, it's a lot more lightweight and much more simple. We're going to use an add dependency endpoint and it's going to be a mutation, which basically indicates we're going to be doing something like a post request. We're going to be mutating the state of the world. It's not just a query. If we go ahead and take a look at it, we can see it's defined here. This is how you define these things in tRPC. Now we have a single block of code here we're going to go ahead and say user.add dependency and pass in some options, which we'll discuss now. Let's go ahead and take a look at add dependency. This may look like an ORM with the user.add dependency call, but this is actually just a plain old object. I've used ORMs for quite a while, they're pretty good, but I'm trying out a SQL builder for this particular application called Keysly, 
It is very type safe and I'm having a great time so far. You can see this is pretty much just the SQL layer. Uh, if we scroll down here, we find add dependency and we're going to go ahead and do a try catch inside of here as well. This is where we're going to do our query. We're just going to go ahead and insert into the dependencies table, uh, the user and the name of the dependency. If everything goes according to plan, that's it. We're just going to respond with a 200. If it doesn't, we need to handle that. And you can see this is a little bit of a non-standard way of doing this. There's a few reasons I am doing this. One alternative would be just to throw an error down here or even just grab the Postgres error and carry on with business. What I would like to do is have a very type safe and very uh, expressive error layer in my application. I am using TRPC as I mentioned and that comes with its own error handling as well. So I've decided to rely on, my, uh, rely on my tools as much as possible, in this case Postgres and on TRPC. So I decided I wanted to use this TRPC error class. Let me show you why I'm using this. I'm just going to head over to my uh, browser and show you the network tab. Let's go ahead and submit this again. And we're getting an error. This is not just any error, however, it's a very specific one. It is a 409. And this HTTP code is used to indicate a duplicate resource. Uh, so this is a very correct and uh, pragmatic way of doing this. And we're getting that for free because we're using the TRPC error. What this means, unfortunately, is I need to use this specific class. And this uh, is something I don't want to do in my SQL layer. If I was to catch the error here and then throw it, you can see my network layer is now leaking into my database layer. And this is something I do not want to do. I want to keep this, uh, this class here just doing database calls and nothing else. For that reason, I've decided to inject the error handling using this error handling function. Let's go ahead and take a look at that one and see what it does. So we're injecting this one here. Uh, it is a bit overly verbose. I'm not happy with it, but I'll tell you how I intend to fix this in the future. For now, what we do is grab the error if one exists, and we're going to go ahead and check if it's a duplicate error resource. So I'm going to be very explicit about how I handle my errors. Remember, errors are a feature. If we take a look inside of here, I'm not very happy with this class. It's kind of large and complicated, but what I am happy with is this error handling check here. We're just going to grab the error and see if it includes this error. And this is what I talked about earlier around coupling myself to my database. Uh, this is what Postgres throws when there's a unique constraint error, but in another database, it may throw something a little bit different. So if I did move databases, which is very rare, I would have to make sure I update these errors as well. Either way, for now we are using Postgres and we have this error handling function. If it is a duplicate error, which is an error I'm expecting and aware of, I'm going to throw the correct error, which is going to be a conflict or a 409 with a nice error message. If it's an unexpected error, for now I'm just going to throw it. What I would like to do in production is have some logging and also probably have a bit of a nice generic error message to throw. Like something went wrong, please try again. Uh, so now I have this error handling inside of my controller, which I'm not that happy with. What I would like to do is keep this controller as thin and simple as possible. So what I could potentially do here is pass in a model, something like user error model dot handle, and I would pass in my error. This would allow me to group all of my errors in a single class and it would make my controller very simple. In addition, I would be very careful about this class and make sure it is not using any server specific code. I would try to make it platform agnostic, so something I could export and import on the front end as well. That way I could share my error handling across my entire application, which is very nice and clean. So although I'm not happy with the code right now, I do have a path forward that I am happy with. One thing I am happy with about this is I have my TRPC error in the exact same place as my TRPC endpoint. I'm keeping all of that network related logic in the same place. Uh, so this is something that is a reasonable compromise I'm happy to make. Uh, that brings us back to the rest of the code. We have our try catch finally. If everything goes according to plan, we just go ahead and update the interface saying it was successful. If not, we're doing a check. Uh, this could be much more explicit. I would be able to import my uh, type safe errors uh, that I'm writing in a platform agnostic fashion and show the correct error message. Uh, and finally, we're going to go ahead and let the form be submitted again. Uh, so I think we're in a pretty good place and I'm pretty happy with this approach. I am especially happy that there's one API request and one uh, database call. And there's definitely a few refactors that need to be made, but I think there's a pretty good way to make that. And I'm excited to see how this philosophy and this approach to error handling plays out across this application. That's all I've got for you today, and I'll see you in the next video.